Pushkine. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, the last speaker in this semester. Uh, uh, Professor Robert Ripplex is uh, one of the uh, most influential living ecologists in the world today. And uh, it's actually quite, uh, for me, and on one hand, it's, it's a pleasure to introduce, but it, and on the other hand, it is quite difficult because uh, uh, Bob's interests covered, uh, I would say, most of uh, ecology and evolution, so it is difficult to say uh, what uh, he uh, was uh, doing, but uh, so, so basically everything. But I would uh, just pinpoint three fields of ecology where, which were important, uh, in which his contribution was important for, for me. One was, uh, or has been, uh, uh, life history theory, evolution of life histories, especially on birds. The second is uh, species richness, or generally diversity uh, gradients, including the anal uh, like the sort of analysis of uh, diversification rates and evolutionary diversification. And the third one is uh, the relationship between biogeography and history on one side, and uh, community ecology on the other side. In fact, uh, his uh, edited volume in uh, mid 90s was a really important book, which firstly uh, pointed out the importance of large scale, uh, both spatial and, uh, and temporal processes for local communities. And I think that. This, uh, this field is the closest to, uh, to the to today's topic, so please. Ah, thank you. So is this on? You can hear me all right? Yes. Well, thank you very much, David. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here, and I've enjoyed talking with uh, David and students uh, in this group this afternoon. It's been very stimulating for me. So this afternoon I'm going to talk about some ideas about communities and the diversity of communities, but I don't have any answers for you, just some observations that I think we need to pay some attention to. So I think um, you know, in this age of uh, climate change, people are very concerned about the response of diversity to uh, changing climate on Earth. and. We, we're paying particular attention now to the distributions of species because recognizing that as uh, the environment is changing very rapidly, the suitable uh, ecological conditions for species are also going to be shifting over the surface of the earth, increasing or decreasing in size and shifting in location. And we're very uncertain, of course, about the way in which species and populations will respond uh, to these. But the, the whole issue of the distribution of species within large geographical regions also, I think, underlies in many ways uh, many of the patterns of diversity that we're, we've been interested in explaining for a long time. And so I'm going to sort of concentrate on some of these large global patterns in diversity, which I think all ecologists are familiar with and which have been known for really literally centuries, that in fact most of the diversity indicated by these red and blue areas here are located in areas where it's warm and wet and it helps if you have mountains around. So I, this is, these patterns have been known uh, for a very long period of time. The explanations for these variations in diversity over the surface of the Earth, though, have varied quite a bit. But since the middle of the last century, and um, people like Lack, Hutchinson, and MacArthur, among many others, there's really developed a, a very um, comprehensive theory of community diversity in which uh, the basic idea really is that species partition in some way the resources that are available to them. And the number of species that can coexist locally depends, first of all, on the total abundance of resources that are available or the total variety of resources that are available. And then secondly, the degree of specialization of individual species to utilize those resources. And in MacArthur's doctoral dissertation, a very famous study on warblers in North America, I mean, he recognized that even though these five species of warblers are very similar ecologically, morphologically, they feed on the same kinds of things, they are 
partitioning the resources based on the parts of the spruce trees, these are spruce trees, in which the birds are foraging. So some are foraging in the outer branches near the tops of the trees, some in the, the duller light uh, towards the base of the tree and so forth. So it is this niche partitioning which allows these species to avoid strong competition with each other and to coexist locally. So if you were to go back into ecology, into the literature of 50 years ago, this type of idea would probably predominate uh, the way in which ecologists think about that. And so the idea was that you would have some array of resource attributes, whether this was the size of prey items or the uh, types of perches that uh, birds were foraging from uh, or the uh, qualities of soil that plants are adapted to or whatever, that you would have some range of resource attributes within a locality and that each species was specialized in some way to utilize a narrow range of those resources and to avoid uh, overlap and competition uh, with other species. So this is the, the sort of the basic idea that developed out of that period. Now, if this is true, then the, if competition really is limiting membership in ecological communities, and if the niche space is somehow filled with species, then you'd expect that the variation in the number of species that you see on Earth should parallel some variation in the physical environment. In other words, if the same processes are acting locally and species are in some way filling the available ecological space, one might predict that species richness, the number of species coexisting locally, would be related to physical and also biological attributes of the environment. And a, a large number of people um, have been for many decades now looking at relationships between attributes of the physical environment and the number of species. For example, this is David Curry at the University of Ottawa. And uh, in 1991, he uh, looked at the relationship between uh, the number of species of trees in North America, and you can see a diagram here showing the uh, diversity contours within that continent. But the point was that there is, of course, a latitudinal gradient, and that gradient is related to potential evapotranspiration, which is uh, a function of the physical environment, uh, precipitation and also actual evapotranspiration, which takes into account both precipitation and temperature. So there are some relationships clearly between the physical environment and the diversity of species. Very often, however, these relationships are not terribly strong. Here's a more recent uh, study by Walter Yetz and, uh, and Kraft, and they looked at florulas uh, throughout uh, the world in different parts of the areas, and of course there are higher diversity in the tropics and in mountainous areas than there were in temperate areas. And you can get very significant relationships between the diversity within these floras and, first of all, the area of the flora and potential evaporation and other um, structural and physical aspects of the environment. But in fact, when you look at this uh, you know, a little bit closer, the the degree of correlation is actually quite low. In this particular instance, which is a global uh, comparison, the deviance is 70% of the total variance, which means only about 30% of the variation is explained. And of course, you can see in these plots here of the individual floras, um, the tremendous amount of variation for any particular aspect of the physical environment. So that even though we do see these relationships between the physical environment and local diversity, they are, they are not explaining in a statistical sense a very high proportion of the data in many cases. And of course, that also does not mean that they're necessarily explaining biologically the relationship between environment and diversity. There are other aspects of this, of course, is that we might expect to see a relationship between diversity and environment through other mechanisms than controlling the amount of, uh, of competition locally and the saturation of species in the ecological space locally. So for example, if you have a clade of species which originates in some particular ecological zone, perhaps a very favorable one, it will tend to diversify 
just because of the conservatism of evolution within that ecological zone building up a large number of species occasionally there may be adaptive shifts over into other uh, perhaps more stressful environments or just different environments but that you will get at the contemporary time at the present day you will see a relationship between diversity and the physical environment solely because of the historical origins of the species and the process of diversification over time. Not necessarily because of a relationship between the physical environment and the capacity of the environment to support uh, different numbers of species. And we also see, and this is, I think, uh, people recognize this quite well, what uh, I like to refer to as diversity anomalies, where if we compare different parts of the world with the same environmental characteristics but different histories, we often find different numbers of species. So for example, if we look at temperate forests, which are growing in environments in Eastern Asia and Eastern North America and here in Europe uh, under essentially very similar ecological conditions, and also many of the same genera of plants, and so the forests have a very similar aspect to them, what we find are, are quite different numbers of species. The black bars here represent the number of genera of tree species in Europe, Eastern Asia, which is by far the most diverse, Western North America, and Eastern North America. But if we look back into the fossil record at the green bars, so this is the number of genera in the fossil record. Europe and Asia are almost at the same level. North America, both in the west and in the east, uh, apparently never had the kind of diversity that you found in Eurasia. But clearly the difference between the contemporary diversity in Asia and the contemporary diversity in Europe has to do with this tremendous extinction, this loss of these fossil genera during the latter part of the Cenozoic period which of course corresponded to climate cooling and then eventually to the glacial cycles, which pushed vegetation to the south. But of course, there was no way to go in Europe. I mean, you had the, Pyrene, the, the mountains, the Alps, you had the Mediterranean Sea, and the extinctions of flora in Europe were tremendous during this period. Whereas in North America and in Asia, the species could migrate north and south with the glacial cycles and extinctions were very much lower at that time. And in fact, that shows up in the comparison between the fossil flora, which are the green bars, and the contemporary representatives of those fossil genera, which are almost the same numbers in Eastern Asia and in Eastern North America. So we have clearly a historical, geographical component to the differences in diversity that we observe at the present time in uh, temperate forests around the world. And uh, of course, one of the interesting differences to me is uh, that between North America and Eastern Asia, Eastern Asia is much more diverse in terms of its uh, plant life and especially forest trees than North America is. And when you look at, so this is a climate, these are climate maps of the two regions, and you look at North America, and North America is basically a very boring continent with regard to its ecology. I mean, you have essentially two climate zones, a very gradual a change shift in environment as you go north. Uh, the mountains uh, in the Appalachians are, are relatively low and they're north-south running, and so it doesn't prevent migrations of species north and south. Whereas Eastern Asia is far more complex. Uh, these areas have been alternately uh, divided and connected by changes in sea level, which allows for allopatric speciation and then species coming back together. The mountains in the south are running basically east-west and there's a lot of opportunity for diversification there. Another aspect of this is that the, um, the boundary between more temperate and more tropical areas is very broad in Southeast Asia, whereas in North America there's almost no connection between the temperate forests and the tropical forests. So it's not surprising just from the geography and the history of the Asian continent that there would be more species uh, in similar environments in Asia than there are in North America. Uh, one of my favorite examples uh, are mangroves, um, which are occupying almost identical habitats in Southeast Asia, in Australasia in general, the Indo-Pacific region, and also in the Atlantic Caribbean region. And yet the diversity difference is tremendous. There are uh, 
uh, uh, 17 genera, and, and depending on how you count, 40 or 50 species in the Indo-West Pacific, but only four genera of mangroves and seven species in the Atlantic Caribbean, only one of which is endemic to that area. The others are related to the ones here. And so even though you have this same environment, you have tremendously different numbers of species in these two different uh, regions of the world. And this undoubtedly is related in some way to the evolutionary origin of mangrove lineages and the fact that these were sort of easier in some way or promoted uh, by the particular geographic configuration like in the Sunda Shelf of Southeast Asia. Anyway. Examples like that, and, and I think uh, you know, other considerations over the last 20 years or so, as David pointed out, have led to a, a broader uh, picture of diversity and the origin of diversity patterns. And I think in particular, one recognizes that you have to start with the diversification of species which occur within large regions, presumably. I mean, species don't form on 10 hectare plots. Uh, you, you need space. Uh, to form new species. So these the diversification processes, which include extinction and also the dispersal or immigration of species from other areas into the region, uh, lead to the formation of a regional species pool, which in then is sorted out in some way through various kinds of ecological filtering, various environmental um, restrictions which are placed on certain kinds of uh, species because of their particular adaptations, which gives you a, a potential local assemblage, which then might be sorted out through species interactions and the ability of species to coexist with each other in terms of resource partitioning and so forth uh, to form an actual local assemblage. And so we have a whole hierarchy of processes that are operating on different spatial and temporal scales and of course this becomes very difficult to sort out just what the relative importance of these different levels of uh, process actually is. So I like to look at uh, this problem of diversity as sort of as a, a regional community rather than a local community focused on a research study plot of you know a hectare or, or 10 hectares. And so what I see is that you have a large region which has gradients of environment and also geographical configurations. And then within that region, you have the uh, evolutionary diversification of species, which is occurring over some amount of time. And of course, it might also include periods of extinction of those species. And this produces the regional species pool, which is then sorted out within this large region. And so you may have species with relatively narrow ranges, others which are very widespread and diverse. And of course, if you look at one particular point within this region, you're going to get the species which are co-occurring locally and forming a local community. But each of those species also has a distribution and a history which incorporates interactions over large geographical areas. And so I think that in order to you know, understand the diversity patterns that we see locally, we have to really take into consideration the distributions of all of these species within the large region itself and what are the forces that are influencing those distributions, both of abundance and also geographical extent. And I think there's no question, and I'll say a little bit about this, that these are very dynamic distributions, that they're expanding and they're contracting uh, all the time over periods which may be uh, quite a bit shorter than we generally consider. Now, there are a number of ways that we can look at the kind of the history of the extent of geographical distributions. And one of the ways is to look at the amount of variance in the abundance and, say, geographical extent of species which occurs between, because of differences between species in the same genus, that is to say closely related species, or between genera within the same family or between families in the same order and so forth. So we can make a hierarchy of effect of taxonomy on the total variance in distribution and abundance. And I've done that here for forest birds of eastern North America. And so this is based on several hundred uh, local 
censuses of birds and the variance in the number of sites. Most of that variation is between closely related species in the same genus, which indicates that this is a evolutionarily very labile trait. In other words, these traits are changing tremendously within the period of time that new species are being formed. The same thing is true of the average density of a species at a particular locality. You can see that almost all the variance is among very close relatives. The same thing if you do an ordination of all of these uh, uh, plots uh, and looking at sort of the location of the species mean on that ordination plot or the extent of the species through the ordination plot. It's all very labile evolutionarily. All of the differences are between closely related species. And just to contrast that with morphological variation, which we assume is more conservative evolutionarily, because after all, our concepts of species and genera and so forth are based on morphological differences, we see that, as expected, the distribution of the variance is much more towards these uh, larger, more inclusive taxonomic units, indicating the general evolutionary conservatism. So this gives us a, an idea that the distribution and abundance of species is actually a, something which is very labile over evolutionary time. One can't tell just how long uh, a time it is in this case. Anytime we look at closely related species, we often find tremendous differences in uh, distribution and abundance. These are four species of hickory in eastern North America. The shagbark and mockernut hickory are very widespread. They have slightly different distributions. Uh, shellbark is primarily restricted here to the Ohio Valley and parts of Missouri. Nutmeg hickory. These all look exactly, well, not exactly the same. To my eyes, I'm an ornithologist. They look quite a bit the same. Um, and, you know, functionally, they're very, very similar. These forest trees that are in the canopy of, of these deciduous forests, and yet one of them is extremely narrowly distributed. Uh, compared to these others. And we see this just over and over again. Here are some examples from uh, herbaceous plants. Uh, the, the gray area is one species, and the little dot within the gray area is a sister species or a closely related species. So you can see tremendous differences in the uh, distributions of these species, even though they're very closely related to each other, and therefore presumably share many of their ecological adaptations. So what's going on here? I'll get back to that in a minute. Another thing that one might expect from sort of the, the theory of resource partitioning is that if you have a, a group of organisms which are, uh, say, rather slow in diversifying and only a few species exist compared to another group which has diversified rapidly and produced a large number of species, that these maybe being closely related to each other would compete more intensively and that they would have to partition resources much more closely within an area and therefore have lower abundances within those, within those areas. So we might expect to find a relationship between the diversity of species within some taxonomic unit like a genus or a family of plants or birds and the average abundance of species within that group. Well, I'll give you a few examples of where I've looked for that. And I mean, one could do this to a greater or lesser degree. Um, these are the average density of species within a variety of families of passerine birds in a forest plot of 100 hectares in uh, the Amazonian basin area in Peru. And it's a very rich area, but what you notice is that irrespective of the number of species per family, so this varies down here from two up to, I don't know, it's 40 or 50 or so, there's no difference in the average density, the average abundance of an individual species. So if birds within the same family are competing more strongly with each other than with birds in different families, it's not showing up in the densities of those particular species in that local area. Um, if we look broader in South America, again looking at passerine birds, what we see is both the number of habitats per species, 
and the number of zoogeographic zones per species, which is a measure of the geographic distribution of these species in South America, there's also no relationship between the number of species per family and the average distribution geographically or ecologically of those species. So this isn't exactly what one would expect from this kind of resource partitioning theory of diversity. Um, going to a different type of organism, uh, these are trees from a number of forest plots, 50 hectare forest plots uh, in the tropics uh, in Panama and Paso Malaya, Cameroon. Um, again, the number of species per family, and we're looking at the average density of the individual species within those families. And again, you can see that over a very wide range of diversity within the families, and presumably each family has species that are fairly similar ecologically, there's no relationship at all between the number of species uh, in a family and the average density of species within those plots. So these are observations which are sort of run against the general idea that resource partitioning and competitive interactions between similar species, an idea that goes all the way back to Charles Darwin, are really important in determining local diversity of various uh, kinds of areas. So possibly one might argue that, well, maybe these more diverse families of birds or trees or whatever are actually occupying more ecological space in total and therefore each species can be sort of equally abundant because the total space of the family is occupied in proportion to the number of species. So that's a, that certainly is a, is a possibility. One of the things is we really don't know how to measure this. We don't know much about the occupation of ecological space. We don't know what a niche is except in some kind of vague conceptual form. And so it's hard to actually quantify this. One of the approaches that I've taken is to actually to look at morphology as a, a sort of a stand-in for ecological relationships. And of course, I think as, as all of you, you know, recognize that variations in morphology, such as the shapes of bills, are also related to differences in the food resources and the way in which uh, birds are actually using those food resources. And so maybe one can use morphology as a measure of, of niche space, although uh, you know, this, these Hawaiian honey creepers are pretty spectacular adaptive radiation. But what one fails to recognize sometimes is that there are equally spectacular adaptive radiations within continental areas, such as these South American uh, Fernareid birds, excuse me, <coughs> which, I mean, I don't mean to offend Fernareids, but they all look about the same. And in fact, they're all doing the same thing uh, ecologically, and you can get 18 to 20 of these species coexisting within the same local forest plot. So anyway, what we do is we measure a number of attributes of birds which are related to the way uh, in which they feed within the structure of the environment and also the prey which they take, so measurements of the bill and the foot and the, the wing and so forth, and we create a, a multivariate uh, morphological space and measure some attributes of that space. And um, what one finds, if one looks globally at the number of species per family level taxon and sort of the variation in size among the species within each of those taxa, there is a, a relationship, although there's a tremendous amount of variation, there is a positive relationship that families of birds with large numbers of species tend to have a little bit more variation uh, morphologically than small ones, although as you can see it's a very weak relationship. In terms of shape, which are, are the other axes of the principal components, there's no relationship at all. It's not significant, this particular uh, <laughs> relationship here. And you know, I, I was kind of almost astonished um, when I looked at the sort of the volume of morphological space occupied by species on different continents, so this is a very crude way of, of looking at the relationship between morphology and diversity. But in fact, I mean, South America has a huge number of species. There are over 2,100 species of passerine birds compared to North America, about 300. And there are similar differences all over the, the world. And one would say, well, maybe, you know, maybe on the continental level, one would find that where there are more species of passerine birds, that there would be a larger morphological space occupied. And in fact, it's not the case. So this is the 
first principal component, which is primarily size. And you can see that no matter what the number of species are, the, the size of the component is the same. And even some of the, the largest one, in fact, is for New Zealand, which just has a very small number of species, but they happen to be a couple of really small ones and a couple of really big ones. And there's a lot of variance uh, in that particular uh, area. If we look at additional components of this space, and so these are just, um, I think, the second, fourth, and seventh principal components. There's no relationship at all, really, between the diversity of species within the continental region and the size of this morphological space occupied. And then in addition to that, you might say, well, it's just because if you have a big continent, the species are, are varying from one place to another. But you can go and look locally within a continent. So these three open circles here and here are local census plots in North America, in South America. This is the Manu plot. This is one in Connecticut. And this is a, a eucalypt forest area in Australia. And again, the local areas have almost the same morphological diversity as the continent does. And so it doesn't seem to be a, a, a problem that there's a lot of sort of variation among uh, different areas in the size of this space. So the overall th thing from, from this kind of a very superficial analysis um, is that there doesn't seem to be any particular uh, relationship between sort of the number of species and the degree of, of niche packing. But we still await really decent ecological assessments of the occupation of niche spaces, something which ecologists have talked about for decades but don't have a very good idea about. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to skip that. Um, the other thing is, of course, that if we're talking about diversity within regions, uh, that diversification occurs within some large geographical space. And the space itself must have some influence <clears throat> on the production of species. And in fact, you can predict, well, let's put it this way, you can relate the number of species within a continent and this, again, is being done for, for passerine birds. I have an obsession with songbirds for some reason. But you can relate the number of species of passerine birds to the area of the continent to latitude. And this is just simply the difference between tropical and temperate areas. So there is something about being in the tropics, which is very important. And the degree of isolation, which just takes into account the fact that Madagascar and New Zealand are, are isolated from major centers to some degree. But doing that, you can uh, account for 95% of the variance of the number of species within each of these large areas. And so there are attributes of the regions themselves which are important contributors very likely to the um, overall diversity within the large region. And so the regional species pool itself is going to reflect in some degree, and I think nobody really would dispute this, uh, various characteristics of the region. And so size is important, whether it's tropical versus temperate seems to be important, although we don't know the reason for that. And um, to some degree, isolation is important. And we have a pretty good handle then on the number of species. This analysis could be done, of course, for many other, many other groups. But if then the regional aspects of species production are important, you know, how is it that we can get a handle on the relationship between these historical processes of the species diversification and the present day patterns of diversity. Well, there are a number of, of uh, people who are trying to do develop phylogenetic approaches to this. And one example I'll give you is of species of butterflies in tropical America. And so these are Heliconian butterflies. And in this particular case, the diversity is shown in the left-hand panel, with red being the highest diversity uh, stringing down the Andes, which is not a typical kind of a uh, uh, formation. I mean, these mountains are always uh, very high in diversity. But you can see the Amazon basin in general having a much higher diversity than other areas which are drier, or even the Atlantic forest uh, down here in southern Brazil. Uh, if one then tries to relate that to the rate of species proliferation, now how do we measure that? Well, in this particular study, what they did was a phylogenetic analysis of all these species and then looked at the depth of the node separating sister species. 
So if the branch length is very short, that means that the probability is that the speciation rate is quite high. If the branch length is long, it means that the species speciation rate is probably quite low because if it were high, then you'd get additional branches on these points and you end up with a situation more like this. So in this case, it appears that the rate of diversification, so which is indicated again by these temperatures, is very high here in the Andes Mountains and in the Amazon Basin. So it corresponds actually quite well to the pattern of diversity overall. These red things here are artifacts of the of the uh, mode of uh, calculation in this case. So there does seem to be some correspondence between speciation rate or diversification rate and present day diversity of species. But there are other uh, studies which have, have some sort of opposite things. So for example, in this study of diversity gradients in mammals, uh, they've looked at the relationship between diversification rates and the latitudinal gradient of diversity of course, there are more mammals in the tropics. I mean, it's just they're like everything else or virtually everything else. And what you see here is that estimates of uh, diversification rates, which are calculated in a variety of different ways here, show no relationship whatsoever between diversification rate and latitude. So this is a case in which there seems to be no correspondence between the gradient in present day diversity and at least some estimate from phylogenetic information of the underlying process of diversification. And we get another interesting uh, situation here. This is a study by Dolph Schluter and, and uh, Jason Weir, where they've estimated the uh, diversification rate very much as in the way that I showed you with the butterflies, of looking at the diversification or the divergence dates between either sister species or haplotypes within sisters and so forth. And what you can see is that those ages are older for tropical species. This is the tropics here. This is higher latitudes. They're older for the tropical species than they are for temperate species. And so the, the surprising result of that is that the estimates of diversification rates, first of all, the speciation rate estimate actually increases with latitude, is lowest in the tropics, and is increasing with latitude, but so is the extinction rate increasing. And so it's the combination of these two which eventually is leading to this pattern of diversity. But I've given you three studies that are completely different in terms of the conclusion about how diversity is related to diversification. And the point is that we're working primarily with these very indirect lines of evidence uh, obtained primarily from uh, the diversification of modern species. A recent study was published by Walter Yetz and his colleagues. Uh, it's, a, it's a great study which uh, came out in Nature. These are all birds. So this is a phylogeny of all birds. There's a little bit of, of having to sort of stick some things into the, the phylogeny that we don't have molecular data for, but it's basically based on uh, gene sequences. And from this, <coughs> excuse me, they have also used divergences between closely related species to estimate the rate of diversification. And so you have again here a heat map of the rate of diversification where these oranges and reds are, are high rates of diversification and blues essentially are very low rates of diversification. Um, and these don't correspond to the diversity patterns at all. Uh, for example, look at New Guinea, a very extremely diverse area. Australia is relatively diverse. These are cold areas, nothing much going on right now. Sub-Saharan Africa, the diversification rates are quite high. Temperate parts of Asia uh, are quite high. The Amazon Basin, low. It's very strange. This is almost counterintuitive. Europe, as you can see, is quite, quite low. Denmark might be the lowest point, but you probably guessed that on you anyway. But <laughs> I don't know how people here feel about Denmark, but anyway. So, so these things are all, I mean, we're trying very hard to get at sort of these underlying processes, and we just continually come up with contradictions, and it's just not clear um, where this is actually going to lead in the future. Even though diversification is sort of one of the underlying major processes that has to be important in understanding patterns of diversity. There are other aspects of diversification that people have become interested in. One of them is the idea that clades 
tend to uh, increase if you look back through evolutionary time in a, a phylogeny, of course you get a coalescence towards ancestors until you arrive at the single uh, common ancestor of the entire group sometime in the past. And so here, for example, are the uh, birds of paradise, and these are the numbers of lineages which are ancestral to the contemporary species. And you notice that the rate of the relation of these lineages begins to fall off with time. If it were a, a constant uh, rate of diversification, you'd get this exponential increase straight line in a log plot, and yet this sort of bends over and curves off. Suggesting that maybe that as the birds of paradise have filled ecological space within New Guinea, which they're practically limited to, that maybe there just isn't any more room for new species and diversification slows up. Another classic uh, example here is uh, by Dan Roboski uh, concerning North American wood warblers, and there you get a very rapid uh, evolution and diversification about five or six million years ago. And so you get a rapid increase in this uh, plot of number of lineages with time, and then it, it basically levels off and not much happens for the last couple of million years. Well, so the suggestion is that, you know, that a, a group will begin to expand and diversify very rapidly, and then it fills the ecological space in some way and no longer can, uh, can diversify. This may well be true. It's not, it's not entirely clear. We were discussing earlier that clades expand and contract, and uh, a lot of it depends on, on which ones you choose to analyze and so forth. But we understand very little about this sort of evolutionary production of diversity and also its loss to extinction processes, which is something we have a, a very poor handle on uh, in many respects. So I'm not going to say a lot about that, except that there are variations on the theme always. So these are the oven birds of South America, of which there are 270 or so species. This is a lineage through time plot for a virtually complete phylogeny, and it's just straight as an arrow. And so the idea is that the number of species the contemporary species are the result of a diversification process over 30 million years or so, which has produced new species at a rate of about 15% of lineages splitting per million years to produce all of this diversity at present. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that if you go back 30 some million years ago, there were only two species of oven birds. I mean, the, the ones that were there may have been just as diverse as they are now, but they've gone extinct and we have no record of them. So we really don't know about that, except that this is a lineage through time plot for a very diverse group of organisms, which is not leveling off. You know, is there some limit to the diversity of oven birds in South America or not? And we really have very little information about that. Um, a recent paper uh, by Piggott and Tobias, uh, University of Oxford, very interesting, again, looking at the situation with the oven birds and asking about the process of species formation itself. Of course, we believe for organisms like birds that species form when allopatric populations, populations that are divided by some barrier to dispersal, uh, differentiate to the point where they're no longer compatible and then it's possible for them to come back into sympatry. And uh, Tobias and uh, Piggott have estimated the percent of pairs which are sympatric is a function of the time since their separation, that is the phylogenetic distance between them. And they suggest that over time it takes, you know, four, eight, 12 million years to build up sufficient differentiation between them that these species can come back together and be compatible, compatible ecologically but of course incompatible genetically and remain as distinct species. So this process of building up species richness within a region like South America suggests in fact that very long periods of time, millions of years, uh, are going to be required for this uh, particular period of, of, of diversification. Now, of course, some of the things that are a little bit unclear about this is this is people who study speciation always phrase this in terms of the accumulation of genetic differences that allow species to come back into contact. Whereas in fact, these species of course were allopatric originally because of some barrier to dispersal. 
And nobody has thought very much about the time period of barriers to dispersal, whether it's a large river, whether it's an area of unfavorable environment or whatever. I mean, those also have time courses and may be also responsible for the way, uh, the time period which is needed for species to be able to come back into contact. I mean, if you separate populations, if you want them to be sympatric again, they have to be able to come back into contact. And so there's a whole process of sort of geographical barrier formation within large continental regions contributing to this whole idea of diversification and building up a regional diversity that we still really haven't addressed uh, in very much detail right now. Well, as I going back to sort of, you know, earlier in the talk when we were, you know, discussing MacArthur's warblers and the partitioning of niche space within a local environment, I mean, ecologists, I think, very firmly got into their minds the, the idea that, um, you know, sort of adaptations for exploiting sort of ecological resources were very important here, and that there was sort of diversification among species and partitioning of, of various niches, which might be based on morphology or behavior or whatever. I mean, clearly within a local forest, what flycatchers and warblers and woodpeckers and thrushes do, they're all different roles that they're playing. And so this is sort of the concept I think that Charles Elton had uh, back in the 20s of each species playing a different role in nature in some way and being adapted to play this different role. But ecologists also have adopted the same kind of an idea to geographical continuums and ev ecological conditions that each species has some kind of a narrow region of ecological space, whether it's a temperature range or a precipitation range or, or whatever, uh, in which it can be really effective as a competing species and an exploiter of the local resources. And so we tend to see um, the distribution of species within niches, within communities, very narrowly as sort of these very specialized distributions where each species has, each species has kind of a, a role within that space, but we also adopt that for these geographical gradients uh, in physical conditions, that species are adapted to function well within a narrow range of temperature, moisture, soil conditions, or whatever uh, trait is important to the distribution. But I think actually that there's a sort of a different way of looking at this, and I hate to admit this, that actually that, uh, that Steve Hubble, who came up with the idea that, uh, well, this is this unified neutral theory of uh, biodiversity, that species are actually equivalent to each other, and that most of the variation in distribution and abundance is just the result of random processes. I don't go that far, but I think the, his observation that in fact instead of these very narrowly partitioned um, conditions of the environment, the species distributions may actually, or their ability to utilize environments may actually be much more uh, like this right-hand position where the differences are there, but they're very shallow. And so what that means is that the change in, say, the productivity of a species, its population demography, the number of offspring it produces, and so forth, that if this changes for any one species, raising or lowering that line a little bit, that can have a huge impact on the distribution of a particular species and probably also on its abundance. So even though there are ecological differentiation among all of these species, just as we imagine here, they're fairly narrow. This may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but they're fairly narrow, meaning that small changes in the productivity of those populations may be very important for distribution and abundance. Of course, the question then becomes, I mean, if one sort of thinks along these lines, what is the underlying cause of these differences in productivity of populations, and why should they vary so much from, say, time to time? Remembering that distribution and abundance are extremely labile and differ uh, mostly among closely related species. So I just tell you, I mean, how this idea got into my mind um, a fixation on it, I guess, in some, <laughs> in some ways. It goes back to uh, studies which I was doing um, on the biogeography of birds in the West Indies 
many, many years ago, in fact, as a sort of a beginning graduate student. Um, these are the Lesser Antilles uh, going from South America, Trinidad here, up through a nice chain of volcanic islands. Um, and of course, there are a lot of species of birds which are distributed among those, and they're nice to study, but anyway. One of the things that I noticed was, of course, that the distributions and the degree of um, geographic differentiation of these species varied a lot. So you have some like the gray kingbird over here on the left, which is distributed on all the islands throughout this area, and they're undifferentiated. You can't tell them apart from one island to the next. So you pick them out of a museum drawer and you look at them, they all look the same. And they're found all in large islands like Guadeloupe and on the smallest pieces of rock that have suitable vegetation on them. So they just, they just get everywhere. And then you see others like the house wren, which is widely distributed for sure, but it's geographically very differentiated. So all of these island populations, they have different subspecies names and you look them in the museum drawers and they're very different. And you go even further and look at something like Adelaide's warbler, which now is, um, these are two different species. They've been called two different species. They're about a million years apart. And yet, you know, they must have existed on these intervening islands. Suitable habitats are there and so forth. But between Barbuda and Dominica, whatever, not Dominica, excuse me, St. Lucia, whichever those island populations have probably gone extinct. And then we see others like the Lesser Antillean bullfinch, which is endemic to the Lesser Antilles, but widespread among all of these islands. Again, it's found almost everywhere on those islands, which must have expanded from within the island archipelago itself because they don't exist anywhere on the mainland. So that at least is an inference that one can make. So we seem to have a, a progression in this uh, of expanding populations coming up from some area like South America spreading throughout the island chain, uh, eventually differentiating over time because these islands, once they're colonized, there's not that much movement between them compared to the size of the populations. So the local populations begin to differentiate, and then you get fragmentation, extinction uh, of island populations, leaving remnants, and eventually possibly re-expansion. So this is this extremely sort of dynamic expansion and contraction, which we can infer from the sort of the geographical distributions combined with phylogenetic information uh, on these birds, showing that this is really a, is a time course. Um, and what's causing this? You say immediately, well, you know, the last several hundred thousand years have had glacial cycles of uh, warming and cooling temperatures and then within these islands temperatures did change but also precipitation patterns change but these expansion and contraction phases are actually quite a bit older than that and the other thing is that similar species ecologically could be in very different portions of the expansion contraction cycle okay so that you couldn't relate expansion or contraction to a species ecology or to its phylogenetic position or anything. It's completely idiosyncratic in some ways. And so that suggested to me at the time, a long time ago, and George Cox and I, when we published on this in the 1970s, suggested that these cycles were the outcome of coevolutionary interactions between species and various antagonists that they had. And so you have a situation in which every species has predators, it has pathogens of various sorts. Also, there are various mutualists, but when you consider predators and pathogens, the species, the host, is always trying to get a little bit ahead of the game, and any kind of um, genetic adaptation which it has, any mutation that comes along which helps it to resist a prominent pathogen is going to be selected very rapidly and the host species will do better as a result whereas the pathogen itself might also uh, go through similar kinds of evolution and of course they do, they do go through similar kinds of evolution and get the upper hand and so one can imagine that there's a continual back and forth uh, in this game which is depending um, at least in part maybe even in large part on random mutations that come up which are affecting this, this interaction between them. And of course, it isn't just one host and one pathogen. There are whole communities of these which are involved in these interactions. So, so the, the kind of insights that I gained from 
these, from just studying these patterns of distribution was that in fact a lot of the variation in distribution and abundance, uh, not only within these island chains, but these island chains are just a mirror of what's happening within large continents. Uh, it's just it's easy to study where you have these discrete populations. That a lot of this variation in distribution and abundance is being actually caused by relationships with pathogens and other kinds of antagonists. And now there's a fair amount of work being done, for example, on forest trees in the tropics, which is showing, in fact, that various kinds of soil fungal pathogens are having tremendous influences on the densities of particular tree species uh, within areas like the Barrow Colorado Island forest plots and so forth. So there are data which are, are sort of appearing now which are very consistent with this kind of a scenario. Much of what we know about invasive species, for example, relates to the, uh, the fact that many invasive have left behind their pathogens in their native areas. And when they come into a, a new area, they're free of many of these pathogens and can expand extremely rapidly. So there, there are a number of reasons to believe that this scenario might in fact be true. And as a result of that, you know, many years ago, we s sort of thought about what would be an interesting um, sort of model system to be able to look at uh, within these West Indian birds. And we s thought, because a lot is known about avian malaria and it's relatively easy to assess uh, just from a blood sample of birds, you don't have to do a lot of complicated work to get at this, then maybe we could look at uh, these malaria parasites and uh, get some insight into the way in which parasites are related to host distributions. And I can just show you a couple of, of examples which will indicate how complicated it is. So this bird here is the banana quit, which is probably the most abundant bird in the West Indies. And these are the distributions of a couple of lineages of malaria parasites. The names don't mean anything one way or the other, um, which are forming some uh, uh, evolutionary clade of these malaria. So these are the malaria parasites and their evolutionary relationships. They're all found within this one host of um, bananaquit, Cereba flaviola. But the distributions are, are kind of weird. So very common, for example, this lineage LAO7 on Puerto Rico and on a couple of islands in the uh, Lesser Antilles missing from Guadeloupe and Dominica where the banana quits are very abundant. Um, related clades are found in uh, banana quits on Jamaica and on the Cayman Islands. Uh, a couple of other related clades are in different species on Hispaniola. The banana quit itself is missing from Cuba. Interesting, interesting phenomenon. There are actually quite a few birds that are missing from Cuba for some reason, not because of political <laughs> sorts of things, I don't think. But what one sees is, is just a, a tremendous heterogeneity in the distribution of these different lineages. And you have, for example, this DRO3, which is very abundant on the island of Hispaniola, but it also shows up over here on the island of St. Vincent and with nothing in between. So there are indications of sort of, again, a very dynamic relationship between the host and its parasites. And for example, if you look at a single lineage of parasite, so this is OZ21. It's one of the most abundant parasites, malaria parasites in the West Indies. And this is the frequency the prevalence in the banana quit, and this is the prevalence in another common bird in the Lesser Antilles, the Lesser Antillean bullfinch. There seems to be almost sort of an, an inverse relationship over these major islands within West Indies, suggesting that this parasite might be sort of shifting from one host to another host in different areas. Uh, there are none on Barbuda and Antigua, which are dry islands towards the north, but in those islands, the Lesser Antillean bullfinch is heavily infected with another lineage, a whole different uh, lineage of parasite. And neither one of these species has OZ21 on Grenada, but there's another lineage of parasite that apparently is heavily infesting both of these species on that island. 
And so we, we see at least some evidence that there's a tremendous variety in the outcomes, which are probably reflecting these different coevolutionary outcomes of these parasites on individual islands and individual island populations, but also taking into account the community relationships because they also may be infecting other host species at the same time. And I think the point is that this is a very dynamic relationship. So what do we do? Conclude. Uh, from all this, then maybe we can have a little bit of uh, discussion. Um, I think that uh, certainly we have to take into account uh, large-scale uh, diversification and distribution within regions, which are going to really be key to understanding patterns of local diversity within, uh, within large areas. I think um, these large-scale processes are, are certainly acting and they are contributing along with local interactions, uh, competition, predation, and mutualism, and so forth, to determine the uh, patterns of diversity within large areas and within the, you know, the Earth as a whole. I think the other thing that we have to really acknowledge is that species distributions uh, and abundance are really dynamic, and they're really idiosyncratic. That is to say, very closely related, very similar species can be very widespread or very narrowly restricted to a particular area. They can be abundant or they can be rare. And that it's very difficult to explain those differences on the basis of ecological adaptations, which are evolutionarily conservative, because after all, these are very closely related species. And so this is one of the reasons why I think that relationships with pathogens and other antagonists are really important. I think that, that competition, even though competition for resources is an extremely powerful force in ecology, which one can show experimentally and have shown experimentally over and over again, it isn't clear how important this is for actually shaping local communities, the particular occurrence of species within local areas. They are evidently and undoubtedly competing with each other strongly and influencing each other's abundance when they do co-occur, but I don't think that these competitive relationships are going to help us to understand necessarily the particular species that are occurring uh, within areas locally. And I think that, of course, diversity at all scales is going to depend on this problem of species formation within this large regional context and that ecologists are now really beginning to pay much more attention to these large-scale processes of species proliferation and diversification and extinction, which is very difficult to get at uh, within, these, within these large regions. So I think that um, one of the conclusions that I've come to, and I'm not going to bet my life on it because I'd like to live a little while longer, uh, is that the variation in distribution and abundance uh, really might reflect the outcome of these host pathogen uh, interactions. These are very evolutionarily labile. They depend a lot on sort of just the luck of the draw with mutations about whether this is going to help you or hinder you in terms of your distribution and abundance, and that a lot of the variation that we see in nature is going to be the result of processes like this, which of course makes things appear more random and more difficult to uh, in fact, makes sense of. So um, these are, I think, they're sort of observations that have impressed me about nature. They're kind of natural history observations that we see from sort of patterns of uh, distribution. There's no experimental work uh, involved in this. It's just taking uh, observations of patterns in nature and sort of trying to think a little bit about what some of the implications of those patterns are and how they might um, influence the way that we think about sort of the, the patterns of diversity and species organization in communities that we see. So that's enough, I think. And I thank you very much for your attention and be glad to give. <laughs>